that's nice. Oh. Les 403 sont renversés, la grève sauvage générale. Les portes finissent de brûler, les enragés ouvrent le bal. Il est 5 heures, Paris. L'humanité, l'humanité, orgasme centrale du Parti communiste français. 10 francs, le programme commun réactualisé. 10 francs. Tenant dans la main le programme commun. Demandez Karl Marx. Allez, il y a des dizaines d'années. 20 francs, le Parti communiste français. Soutenez les communistes italiens. 20 francs. Demandez. Demandez les efforts du vol et de manière centrale du Parti communiste français. This is a Communist Party rally in Paris, just before the French elections. And I'm looking for a French-Canadian journalist who's supposed to be covering it. Robbie Tai, Bernard Robbie Tai. Robbie Tai? Yeah, that's me. Uh, you know Nick Aftermeyer? Yeah. He, he told me when I came oh, to yeah, Paris that I, yeah, that I should uh, find you because uh, I'm doing a film How here. How did you get into here? Well, I have a film board card. Oh. I want to do a film about the sort of crisis on the left. Well, I read some writing, of your articles. I'm not writing many articles. My newspaper is in strike now. I don't know if it would be a bother to you, but uh, if we could spend some time together after this is over, well, maybe tonight. Yeah, I think it's, it's not. A, yeah, I think it's not the right place to. Uh, Okay. Yeah, it's starting now, isn't okay. it? We so can discuss. I see you later? Oh yeah, we can meet and maybe it's possible, I don't know. Aujourd'hui, dans notre pays, certains ont un revenu de 3 millions d'anciens francs par jour. Marché says that in France today, certain people make over $6,000 a day. 10% of the population have one third of the disposable income. En France, c'est-à-dire plus de 400 milliards. I notice a tape waiting to be played with the Soviet anthem on it. My contact, Bernard Robitai, says it will be amazing if they play it. In other words, he concludes, we are going to make the rich pay. We'll win. Or better still, you'll win. Les rebelles, non que les voitures à brûler, que vouliez vous donc la belle, qu'est-ce donc que vous vouliez des canons So you want to know how many tendencies there are here? Yes, yeah. yeah, I'll show you. Allez, donnez-moi le Parisien libéré. That's a very working class, a very, ex not extreme right, very right, a bit racist newspaper. Terrorism, political terrorism, very big circulation. Ah, l'humanité. Communist, 150,000. Oh, yeah, hammer and sickle, yeah. yeah. Figaro, the re respectable daily, uh, you know, morning newspaper of the right. 
Libération. Maybe we should go there sometime because it's very typical. It's a May 68 to children who read that. Yeah. Here we have the 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 old man uh, newspaper, the uh, right rightest old man and old lady reading <laughs> Laura. Yeah. You know, it's uh, a bit uh, going to bank bankruptcy. Uh -huh. This newspaper quite bad, quite badly done. These are all daily newspapers? All daily. Incredible. Here you have Incredible. the smallest one, a Maoist. Very orthodox Maoist newspaper. Um, must be a circulation of 3,000. There's but still the hammer and sickle there. Yes, but very much uh, anti-French uh, Communist Party. Uh -huh. Very much hostile. And here you have one of the most recent, which is pro-socialist, more or less. Pro-socialist, yeah. you, you know, Union of the Left newspaper. 100,000 circulation. And last, the... Uh, oh, I forgot, I forgot. The best ah, of the lot. <laughs> Le Monde. The best. Ah, that's something special, you know. Somebody told me that there was... In France, you had three parties. The right, the left, yeah. and Le Monde, you know, which yeah. is the conscience yeah. of the state and of the nation. I noticed one interesting... Very big, very big one circulation. One interesting thing in this newspaper, there are no photographs. No photographs. They think that it's useless. Uh, that's 10 francs. That's you take ten. it, you take yeah, it. Yeah, 10, 10, 10. That's it. New pieces. For five years, he's been the Paris correspondent for a Montreal newspaper. This is all uh, La Presse. La Presse. It's not exactly uh, Le Monde or uh, New York Times, is it? A small, obscure French-Canadian newspaper. Yeah. Well, actually, when you say I come from La Presse, they say, what? What is it exactly? Yeah, people don't That's know. quite impressive, I must admit. All of that. Malraux. Aragon. Aragon. Who's Aragon? A great uh, communist uh, poet and uh, novelist. Mm-hmm. Very old now. Very old. And, ah, here you are. Ah, I see Louis. my photograph when I was young, with a moustache. This is I your, was very nice at that time. Your trip to Prague. Yeah, yeah very interesting. Mm. And here's Sartre. Yeah. We won't get him for sure. Uh, impossible to get him. Almost impossible. That's an interview we bought, and I made the introduction. So. Well, okay. we'll make him some coffee. Do you want some? Okay. Yeah. Why do why do you uh, why do you stay in Paris anyway? Well, I've been really fascinated by mm, coffee. I've been really fascinated by uh, the French politics for two, three, four years. But I mean, do you stay in do you stay in Paris because you like Paris, or do you stay? Oh, you don't I feel happy in Quebec, or what? Well, let's say I have a hay fever in Montreal. That's the reason I I had to go. You have a political hay fever? Well, well, well maybe if I have to go back to Montreal, I will go back to Montreal. Yeah. I, I was very happy when I was there. It's not going to be easy to work with Bernard. The mornings are virtually lost. He rises about 10, goes to his favorite pastry shop where he buys a pan chocolat. This he takes to his favorite cafe where he has one or two double express bien serré, double espressos well squeezed. Then he reads newspapers to about 12, or did before I met him. Uh, too early in the morning. Not too fast now. Normally, I quite like motorcycles, but now. Bernard confesses that he's as blind as a bat. This is quite terrifying on the back of here. You, I say it's terrifying. So I think you, uh, it, that would be a very good idea to uh, photograph me uh, in front of that building for my mother, of course. Okay. That's the, that's the building, that the headquarters of the Communist Party. It's at the same time very modern. It was built by the 
one of the most important architects of the world, uh, Nimeyer, who's the, who made Brasilia in Brazil, the capital of Brazil. So it's look is very modern, very futuristic, and at the same time, it's a bunker, you know? Over there, you have the, it's the only entrance. It's very narrow. Only one person at the same time can get in. It's the only entrance of the uh -huh. building. And it, it, yeah, it reflects a bit like uh, the, the nature of, of the party, which is very secret and it's a bit, uh, it's very secret. Secret tunnels? Secret tunnels, yeah. Maybe uh, some of your American uh, journalist friends uh, told you that there was a tunnel leading from the, down in the, from the cave, how do you say? The basement? From the basement of the party to, uh, directly to Moscow, to bring the gold of Moscow, yes? You heard that, no? no. You didn't hear that, no? No. <laughs> uh, it's a legend by... Uh, it's a rich party? Yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a very rich party, in a way, yeah. Because if you have all the members of parliament, they give their salary to the party and they, they're paid the, the salary of a specialized worker. So they live by their principles, really. You, know, you can say even the the their adversaries say there no there's no corruption. Uh, very, very honest. Very. Oh. But why why is it that uh, that uh, you don't you take so little notice of the socialists? Well, because why, why do you take so little notice of the socialists? Because they're a bit. Uh... They're very important, and at the same time, they're very insignificant because they're a bit wishy-washy. They're just between uh, between the communists, who are kind of a very hard line, and they're... He was born in North America, uh, but never in his life before has he had to speak as much English as he speaks these days with me. La radio vous ment. La télévision falsifie la position des communistes. La presse. This is your uh, this is your understanding. Yeah, yeah. If I were and, French, uh, if I were French, that woman over there would be my uh, the candidate of my riding, uh -huh. communist candidate of my riding. C'est ensuite finalement quand on est dans le parti qu'on se rend compte qu'on aurait pu le faire depuis longtemps. Parce que on, on rentre jamais à 100% d'accord avec tout ce qui se passe dans le parti. C'est en étant finalement et en venant dans les réunions de cellules et en discutant qu'on évolue. I think she's a, in a way she's a very um, typical candidate of the of the communist party, very practical talking about. Here yeah, you have three quarters of the lodgement without a bathroom. They're all, all, always talking about uh, the same thing, and I think that's the, probably the explanation of the strength of the Communist Party because they they're very close to the very basic problems basic problems of the people You live here she asks Yes replies Bernard I live in the 11th arrondissement How long have you been in the party Duslin? Six years I joined quite late I'm 40 now you know for years, I had voted communist without really committing myself. With four children, political involvement seemed uh, a bit impractical, and my job's demanding. Is your husband a doctor too? Yes, he's a researcher and also a communist. Is it, uh, is it true that you're going to vote for the Communist Party? <laughs> no, <laughs> definitely not. Why not? Why not? <laughs> well, because I've never been for communism uh, and, uh, and I don't like them right now on top of everything. But your sister... Marie-Pierre Cartier is a colleague of Bernard's and a journalist too. Yeah. If you, you, you really want yes. my real feeling... <laughs> Communism is for nuclear power, communism is for the army, communism is for centralism. Communism, I mean, it's, it's just a very reactionary party. I mean, they are years behind, all right? They are, I mean, they are out.
the socialists and the communists were united for about four or five years. The common front, is it? Yeah, the Union de la Gauche, Programme Commun. But uh, they broke the, uh, the Union last September. Why? Well, nobody knows exactly why. But I think people suspect the communists not wanting to go to the government because the socialists were a bit too strong for them. responsabilités au cours de ces dernières années et nous disons ce que nous allons faire et nous sommes les seuls. Mitterrand a été donné des paroles comme ça trois fois par jour. Donc, bien sûr, le scrutin le 12 mars, car il n'y a pas d'automatisme, il n'y a pas de mécanisme. Il n'y a pas de no pas de spring, no magic key to make everything work. There is man and what man is. All men with power go to the ends of their power. It's in us too, and that's why we socialists seek not only to build socialist power, but to prepare at the same time counter powers. How does it work? Yeah, you see, the election is a bit like a, con a leadership convention in Canada. You have two rounds. The first round, you have many, many candidates, 10, let's say 10, in every riding. And then, on the second round, you have, in general, only two. And the other ones who have been in eliminated, they... They... they Put their votes somewhere in else. In favor, yeah, in favor of one or the other candidate. But the electors, they, they follow or not. Are these, uh, are those kids there what you call uh, punks? No. I think we have the champion of the... Actually, neither of us is particularly interested in the elections. What intrigues us is the change that is taking place in and around the left. Hegel, Marx, yeah. the Rosa Luxemburg. The whole history is there. More Marx, 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 yes. Marx, Marx. Yeah, he the capital. Long. Here you have an idea of uh, the debate that's in uh, that's going on in. Uh, mm -hmm. You mean the anti-Marxist anti debate, huh? The debate about Marxism. I think we can say it starts with Solzhenitsyn. Mm -hmm. You know, that was a big uh, blow. But at first he going he back was, to Marx, uh, going yeah. back to Lenin and Marx. Yeah, but I mean, at first he was he was uh, rejected because he was considered to be reactionary. Huh? I mean, what he was saying about the West seemed to be so reactionary that. Mm -hmm. uh, they rejected the Gulag too. Huh? More or less, yeah. And then there was an, another wave coming in with mm -hmm. uh, former people who were who were uh, former leftists of uh, May 68, like uh, André Glucksmann, who was uh, first a communist, then uh, a Maoist, mm -hmm. and who wrote a book, uh, La Cuisinière et le Mangeur d'Homme, Cook and the uh, Man Eater. Yeah, I, re I read this one. Uh, mm -hmm. He's more or less saying that uh, that uh, that. Marxism is as bad as uh, as uh, Nazism. That's, uh, in fact, he says the concentration yeah. camps, Marxism. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, it's, yeah it's Who else in that, that school? Important. Well, the big star is Bernard Henri Lévy. Yeah, he's the publisher of most of the new philosophers, and finally he be he became a new philosopher himself with his book Barbary with a human face. But now, how is the how is the uh, Communist Party uh, reacting to this? I mean, are they sort of counter-attacking well, or, or are they just taking it? Uh, where are they? Oh, here you have the liberal one, Jean Ellenstein. He's very important because he's kind of a, a liberal avant-garde of the Communist Party. He's more, more an historian than a philosopher. You say they they change they change quite quite a lot in the in the last years. Mm. Now they're putting in question uh, USSR and uh, East Europe uh, regimes. Uh, if you take uh, even René Andrieux, who's considered as a hardliner in the party, mm -hmm. he's the um, editor in chief of uh, L'Humanité, which is a daily newspaper of uh, mm -hmm. the Communist Party. Okay, who should we see? Uh, well, Solzhenitsyn's a bit difficult. So let's see, Garodi. Let's see Jean-Pierre Fay about Czechoslovakia and the Communist Party. 
people of the Communist Party, Andrieu, Allenstein, Glucksmann, is very interesting. Dumont, the agronomist. Who else? Well, if you insist to have a star, we can see uh, Lévy. I know you like that. <laughs> You're very impressed. Yeah, You've I'm never seen impressed. so many books. Well, mm. maybe, maybe you make films, but you don't read a lot. If you're illiterate, uh, don't, don't think everybody, uh, all your public is the same. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, I think a little history lesson uh, would be just very good for you. And uh, here in this cemetery of the Père Lachaise, you have many important things of the memory of the revolution in Europe. So you see this wall, it's called Le Mur des Fédérés, very, very important. And uh, uh, it was uh, it's the symbol of the Paris Commune in 1871. Uh, first proletarian revolution that lasted for four weeks. It was smashed by the rightist armies. And you see against that wall, people were executed. Right here? Yeah, three, maybe a few thousand people. Mm. It seems like there are marks that uh, could almost be bullet holes there. Yeah, who knows? I don't know. So here you have the graves of uh, all the past leaders of the Communist Party in the century. So you have Duclos, Torres, who was the leader of the Communist Party for 40 years. At that time, they really believed that Stalin was a god, USSR was a paradise, and... Uh, the Paris Commune is important because, according to socialist historian and writer Jean-Pierre Fay, the fall of the Commune greatly influenced the first Soviet leaders. They wanted to build a, an open state. They wanted to build a, a worker state for all the people. But then they were captured in a kind of of trap in which they fell, more or less willingly, because uh, they, they decided not to fall in the weakness, the weaknesses that had been those of the Commune of Paris, for instance. So Lenin said, well, the Commune was, was smashed, so we must be hard. And being so hard, they finally put out all the others, all the other parties of the, the socialist left. There were almost four or five in the beginning, all, all in the Soviet uh, Congress of 1917. And finally, Lenin remained alone with his one-party states. This built the process of the total state in, in Russia. So when the Czechs, for instance, took took the process in hands in 68. They began to build, to build back the political means. They came back to the freedoms, to the human rights, so to speak, to the, the freedom of speech, of association, of meeting, of, of the press. In fact, the, the, we could say that this, the Soviet Union uh, invaded Czechoslovakia to break this socialist invention of a new society with democratic freedom. So this is Prague, exactly 10 years ago, another anniversary. And it makes me very, and it makes me very mad to think that those tanks are still there today. Just like it used to make me mad to see Americans in Vietnam. It's wrong. Yeah, well, I think uh, everybody was mad and everybody's still mad. And uh, if you want to understand something, you have to understand that the first ones to be mad were the people in the communist parties in Italy and France who were uh, definitely opposed to uh, this intervention in Czechoslovakia. <laughs> Always they say the same thing. Why are you here? Speak to us. You're communist, aren't you? 
What are you doing here? There's no counter-revolution here. Well, look, if you're really interested in Czechoslovakia, instead of looking at uh, old images, there's somebody living in Paris that you could see. It's uh, Arthur London. You know who he is, no? No. He was in the um, trials in 52 and condemned to life prison at that time. And uh, he's in Paris, he's very old, but uh, I think uh, we can see him. Madame London shows us microscopic letters written on cigarette papers that her husband managed to smuggle out of prison, warning her that he would confess, but not to believe the confession. How they made him confess is the subject of his book. Time passes so quickly. It's 25 years since the trials took place, one of the most tragic trials ever staged. For of the 14 accused, 11 were condemned to death, and every one of them was executed. It's very depressing, isn't it? It was terrible because we were innocent. The confession of Slansky, one of those who died, exists on film. He says, I acted as an enemy defending the interests of the Anglo-American imperialists. And I betrayed Czechoslovakia. When did you join the Communist Party? Fifty years ago. And I've been active all my life. And I'm still active and a supporter of socialism, but a different socialism from that which Stalin made. Now, before the trial in Czechoslovakia, there were trials in Hungary, in Moscow, and they were also phony trials, and yet you believed in the guilt of the accused. Yes, we asked questions, but not many at the beginning, because we had total confidence in the Soviet Union, total confidence in Stalin. La confiance inconditionnelle pour Staline, et puis il y avait une chose, il y a eu Mussolini. And then there was Mussolini and Hitler and Franco. We had the enemy in front of us. And we just didn't have time to look behind us at the people who were perverting socialism, setting up a police state. We just didn't have time to analyze those things. It was perhaps a weakness of our generation, but it was like that. Everybody defended the Soviet Union. Everybody defended Stalin. You know, Marx once said something when his daughter asked him one day what was the most admirable human quality. He replied, the doubt, and that's it. When you see the Russian dissidents today, can you understand why most of them totally reject the system? Solzhenitsyn, for example. Solzhenitsyn, for example, I admire all his writing, magnificent writing. And I admire his fight in the Soviet Union for liberty, for free speech. And they deported Solzhenitsyn by force. I'm not 
But I don't agree with Solzhenitsyn when he goes to the States and blames the Americans for losing the Vietnam War. And when he goes to Spain, Franco is still alive and says that never did he feel so free as then in Spain. I don't agree with that, and I can't agree with that, and I must fight it. But you remain optimistic about Eurocommunism? I remain an optimistic supporter of Eurocommunism. I think that Eurocommunism started with Khrushchev. The 20th Congress, the Spring of Prague. The tanks crushed the movement, but the idea of the Spring of Prague, of socialism with a human face, still lives. Did you know that when the tanks were crushing the Prague Spring, that there was also resistance in the Soviet Union? Seven people and a baby actually demonstrated on Red Square. One was a worker, Victor Feinberg. You were in Leningrad. Yes. And you, yes. you read in the newspaper that, uh, that the Russian troops were in Czechoslovakia. So you, de you decided to come to Moscow to make a Yes, I thought uh, it was such a big blow, not only against the Czechoslovakian experience, um, but all, also against the human rights movement in the Soviet Union. Because for us, the Czechoslovakian endeavor to make a peaceful revolution was very mm, precious. It's you arrived, I think there was a little uh, children, uh, how do you say? Brian. Yes. Bram, yes. Uh, well, I think that the most important man who took part in the demonstration was uh, Osik, uh, Joseph uh, Garbanevsky, uh, two weeks old, son of uh, Natasha Garbanevska, the poet who took part in our demonstration. I'm going to summarize the story because Victor's English is a little hesitant. Seven demonstrators met together on Red Square. They had slogans hidden in a pram under a baby. So they got in position and then suddenly the slogans just appeared in their hands from under the baby. What did they say, the slogans? Hands off Czechoslovakia. Freedom, yours and ours. Today, this women's march lasts several hours in Paris. In Moscow, Victor's demonstration lasted a minute or two. The time it took for KGB agents to race across Red Square. They were running uh, and shouting uh, Jews. Uh, I think that only uh, two of us were uh, Jews. They began to beat us, and I felt very, very sick about it, because I was a worker, and uh, well, I wanted to uh, to hit back. But did they beat you severely? Well, they you deprived me of my front teeth only. Yeah. <laughs> These are not mine, the Dutch. <laughs> yeah. So, and then for you, started five years in a psychiatric uh, hospital, which is more well, a prison than the hospital. Yes, uh, mental prison hospital in Leningrad. Mm -hmm. uh, just. Uh, it was, uh, I'm sorry to say, but it was a very good experience because uh, in any other, in no other place, I could see uh, the, such rare examples of the human uh, basement, of the human um, corruption, and of the human dignity and the human courage, as I saw there. Uh, the, I am absolutely sure that the Soviet regime is doomed. It's doomed because uh, opposition movement, especially human rights movement, uh, can't be eliminated. They used all their means. Uh, some people died. Uh, thousands were imprisoned. Uh, but it's an organic movement, and uh, the new uh, people took their places.
three floors above these clanking machines is the elegant office of René Andrieux, the editor of Humanité. René Andrieux, there's a great debate now ranging in France about Marxism, socialism, and democracy. What form do you think that socialism should take in France? En France. Socialism means freedom from exploitation. It should be a society in which the workers are much more free. I must insist on that. For us, the French communists, socialism and democracy are synonymous. Is the Soviet Union socialist then? Yes, if socialism is the collective ownership of the means of production, then from that point of view it's socialist, because there are no small groups of financiers who control the country's wealth. Well, if I might interrupt, I don't think one can say that there's been a phenomenal enlargement either of liberty or democracy. Is it uh, socialist from that point of view? The economic changes necessary for socialism have taken place. And I think that a certain number of liberties have been granted. Are these freedoms essential? I say no. I mean, are they sufficient? I say no. And we've often said that we disagree with the Soviet leaders on the question of democratic socialism. On several occasions we've taken strong positions against what we consider are violations of socialist legality. We think that nobody should be in prison for his opinions. And even if there are only 10, 20, 30 people in the Soviet Union in psychiatric clinics because they disagree with the government. We think that that's intolerable and we've said so clearly. I don't think that we will see a move towards greater democracy in the Soviet Union unless it's the Soviet people who do it themselves. Are you optimistic about that? Moderately optimistic. Do you think it's desirable that the uh, Communist Party hold power alone? No. If we're alone, we'll make more mistakes than if there were several parties sharing the power, even if our positions are basically correct. I believe that criticism, even of opponents, is useful because it spotlights weak aspects of our policy. I'm totally for democratic control. I'm totally against arbitrary power, against the centralized state, against the one-party system. That I don't want. Finally, I got up the courage to ask him a question in my rotten French. I knew that he had debated one of the young anti-Marxists a so-called new philosopher, on TV the night before. What did he think of their total attack? It amuses me somewhat because he said that uh, Marx is dead. I felt like quoting Bernard Shaw who quipped that if Marx is dead, Moliere and Shakespeare are dead too. And I'm not feeling too well myself. If Marx is dead, then the new philosophers must be in really bad shape. Because whatever the differences that exist between socialist countries, Marx's supporters stretch from Cuba to Vladivostok, from China to Vietnam. And that's a reality whether you like it or not. No philosopher in history has left such a legacy. Neither Plato nor Descartes, Kant, none have made such an impact on the course of history. I, look, I don't, want, I don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. You, know, you arrive late, you make uh, bad appointments with Ellenstein. Well, complete bullshit. You want you to, were, you want you to put it. You're completely unprofessional. So we've just missed an extremely important appointment. 
with Jean Ellenstein, the most progressive thinker in the Communist Party. We made an appointment. Bernard overslept. <laughs> and we have to do something about it. Now, go and telephone him right now. He doesn't even remember my name, so it's not the problem. So, a very Parisian event now. The launching of a book of Mathieu Key and the Editions du Seuil. She wrote about China very favorably. And now she wrote a book about her expulsion from the Italian Communist Party. And that Solers is, uh, say, the Pope of uh, the avant garde in Paris. L'emploi que j'ai fait dans ces livres du ton de l'ironie ou de l'humour a voulu être pour moi l'instrument à travers lequel la médiation. Um, At the cocktail party afterwards, Bernard manages to buttonhole the Pope of the Avant-Garde. Uh, Mr. Solers, you've had a, a rather zigzag career in the last few years. You supported the Communists uh, and you were very close to the Chinese. Then suddenly you break with China. Yes, I'm always swinging against the tide, you know. I do things that are out of fashion. A bit of zig and a bit of zag. But you believed in China pretty completely, no? Or you should look at that in a way essentially Dadaist, because I'm fundamentally Dadaist. You know, people don't always see the humor in political postures. They make a religion of it and they're shocked by sudden changes of position like mine. You don't seem uh, very convinced. Most of the people in here, say, shopkeepers, and uh, they just, uh, Chirac gives them what they want, a uh, good, uh, not very subtle anti-communist speech. They like it, as you can see. So be careful. I cry danger, because you will be tricked. The Communist Party, even if it is only the second in votes, as a means to paralyze you and to paralyze France. Moreover, they have not changed their ways. In all the countries that they control, without exception, they continue to put people in prison for a book written or for an idea expressed. So for Chirac and the rest of the French right, the Communist Party hasn't changed. It's still dangerous. But if the Communists are really becoming more democratic, Jean Ellenstein will be able to take some of the credit, since he's the most outspoken critic of the party's undemocratic tendencies. We missed him the other day. Now we have another chance, if Bernard will hurry up. 
We are very fascinated in North America by this thing called Eurocommunism. Is it really something new, or is it merely a um, tactical retreat in the face of the testimony of the Russian dissidents? Oh, I think it goes much further than a tactical retreat. It's the realization by European communists that socialism must be achieved democratically. So the Soviet experience is not applicable. For us, it's more of an anti-model. Now we know what we don't want to do. There's a debate going on in the party. And one of the problems that we're discussing right now is how the party can be more democratic, operate more openly. Well, I have the impression that you haven't succeeded yet. There's a disturbing secrecy around the leadership of the party. What do you say to those who feel that this evolution is so late, that we've lost faith in the Communist Party, that even the word communist is right. so discredited. Why use the same word anymore? If in Canada or France we're not able to solve cultural and economic problems, it's not the fault of socialism, as it has developed in the Soviet Union or in China. It's because intrinsically capitalism is dominated by the profit motive and thus is incapable of solving these problems. So we have to find new solutions, new roads that are neither social democrat, which has failed, nor Stalinist, uh, which has no relevance to our problems. So, new road has to be found, and that's what Eurocommunism is all about. Well, at the cafe, at the... Okay, at the restaurant, okay. Bon, alors, euh, d'accord, on fait comme ça. On passe chez vous demain après-midi. No, absolutely nobody thinks that, ah. that, that a thing like uh, Czechoslovakia or, or USSR could, could happen here. Absolutely nobody believes that except uh, crazy people. Yeah, but what I don't understand, I mean, if the, if the significance of the word communism has come to mean those countries, I mean, it seems like it's time to abandon the word, just like Marx is being abandoned as a sort of... Uh, the name has no importance. In, in, in Poland, they, they, they are not called communists, and they are communists. And the question is much more complicated. In a way, they're playing, but at the same time, they really believe in democracy, but they have a problem to put it in practice. I mean, you can't judge them by what they say they believe in, you have to judge them by what they do. For instance, when you say the, 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 the Communist Party is not democratic, you have to say you have to say that the other parties are not democratic either. Mm -hmm. If you if you see the Republican or the Democrat Party mm -hmm. in the states, are they really democratic? Mm -hmm. But what's what's the democracy in that? So half an hour conversation on telephone with Mr. Glucksmann before coffee, yeah. of, and uh, the water was drying completely in the. Left, 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 you go left. Okay. And uh, so very big discussion. Who's in the film? No, still left, left. More left? Yes. Extreme yeah. left, my friend. And... Uh... André Glucksmann, the man we're about to see, was on the streets of Paris in 1968 when they looked like this. He was not a leader like Colin Bindet. He became one later of an extreme Maoist group called the Proletarian Left. Today, well, we'll see how he feels today. qui a bousculé, certainement bousculé, je suis sûr d'avoir été bousculé. Hein? Ce qui nous a bousculé en France, c'est... Euh... What has really turned us around is the 
resistance of the dissidents in the Soviet Union. For example, Natalia here, who was on Red Square with Victor Feinberg, told me that even before her demonstration, and she'd seen photos of uh, May 68 in Paris. So you see, there's a circulation of ideas like that, which means that because we were critics here, dissidents, we understand better what the Russian dissidents are saying. An underlying rapport that exists when the illusions are stripped away. Illusions like the Vietnam War, a dirty war on the western side, we imagined that it was a clean war on the Vietnamese side. That was false, obviously false. But isn't it necessary to take sides when you have two camps shooting at each other? For us, in the Soviet Union, it was very clear that when North Vietnam succeeded in occupying the South, that this would lead to a big gulag. So it's you who's changed, not communism. Listen, I think it's very important what Natalia said. There was not just a surprise over Vietnam, but there was a willingness not to see, a willingness to be blind. Yes, I've changed. And no, I haven't changed. We were right to protest against the concentration camps of South Vietnam, for instance. And the proof that we were right is that Cambodia, which was perfectly peaceful, an island of peace before the American intervention, became the scene of terrible massacres where American bombers have been replaced by the machine guns of the Khmer Rouge. So in a sense, we didn't change because we were against all massacres and still are, by all states. In another sense, we have changed because we had that willingness not to see. We believed that one side had to be good if the other side was bad. If we can come back to France for a minute, you seem to equate the Soviet Union and the French Communist Party. It's you I haven't spoken about. What, what is your present position? Listen, you wrote an article on me and others saying that because we were not on the left and didn't say nice things about the common program of the left, that we were therefore on the right. Well, I call that the logic of the Cold War. I call that the logic of the camps in every sense of the word. If one can't say that there are lies in politics, lies on the left, as there are lies on the right, and that if every time we say that there's a lie, we're accused of being enemy agents, then I say it's not me that's sick, but you. How would you feel, for example, if you were like me, meeting a young Cuban who really believed in his country, who believes that he's helping build a new society? It's, it's quite impressive. In 1974, I had in fact made two films in Cuba. I was quite impressed by the idealistic young people that we talked to. feel that the government is working for you, for your family, for the, for the whole country, and uh, you become part of that. What fascinates you about that young Cuban? Why didn't you ask him, one, about the concentration camps, two, about the way they treat homosexuals, which exists, three, about uh, what Cubans are doing in Africa, why they're playing GIs for the Soviet Union, you, what fascinates you? Dans ce portrait qui est peut-être fou du jeune Cuban. The young Cuban, I don't know, but you. Well, there wasn't a, 
It wasn't a very good interview that you just did there. <laughs> no, come on. Where, where do you stand, Bernie boy? Where do you stand in this, this debate? Huh? Well, it's very easy to uh, draw conclusions, very, very simple conclusions like that. You say, that was bad, so let's not do it again. Let's just stay as we are now. Let's not try anything. Les 403 sont renversés, la grève sauvage générale. Because there are problems and because the experiences were not very good, let's not change anything anymore. I think that's that's a bit easy. It's not it's not stupid, it's easy. It is very easy. And I think that's the problem of the new philosophers. Les blousons noirs sont à la pub, lance-pierre contre lacrymogène. Les flics sont morts au coin des rues, nos petites filles deviennent des reines. Il est 5 heures. I don't think Glucksmann makes it too simple. It's not too simple to say that one was blind. It is simple to think that the truth about society all comes from one or two great minds and that all virtue resides in one or two great social experiments. It's not simple to admit that the world is more complex than that. After lunch, we're seeing Jean Daniel, the editor of the left-wing Nouvel Observateur. He supports the new philosophers, but with some interesting reservations. The new philosophers are an important phenomenon in France and one that we have helped to orchestrate. But we don't want this movement to lead to resignation. We can't wander like lost children in the middle of the 20th century, offspring of misfortune. Man for us remains capable of remaking socialism while at the same time denouncing the use of that word by the Cubans, the Chinese, and the Albanians. Similarly, we think that it's not because of the Inquisition that some Christians are no longer Christians. We don't say that Christianity is bad because there are bad Christians, but the word socialism has been wrongly expropriated and the new philosophers have made us conscious of that takeover. It seems to me that it would have been much more difficult 10 years ago to say that the Soviet Union and China and so on were not socialist countries. Well, there's always a question of degree. In the case of the Soviet Union, you are wrong. It was quite possible to say that 10 years ago. But since mankind is always looking for a Mecca or a Vatican, a model which exists. So we have moved our dreams from Algeria to Cuba. China has been one of the most enduring examples of our desire to anchor our dreams to some existing models. You're right, that it would have been harder 10 years ago to say that China wasn't socialist. The real difficulty is to resign oneself to the lack of models. Rue Gay-Lussac, les rebelles, non que les voitures à brûler, que vouliez-vous donc la belle, qu'est-ce donc que vous vouliez, les canons Wrong, my friend. You know that this time you were very good, hardly no Australian accent in your questions. That's because Very precise, very good. That's because I didn't ask any questions. Very good, very good. Ce jeu-là que vous jouiez, la règle en paraît nouvelle, quel jeu, quel jeu singulier, des canons à some people still believe in the models. This Maoist group is faithful not only to the China of Mao, but to the teachings of Lenin and Stalin as well. So what countries do you consider now a socialist? Well, this China and a certain number of other countries as well. Albania, North Korea, Cambodia, Vietnam, with variations, of course. What about what's going on in Cambodia uh, right now? The news that reaches us is a bit uh, upsetting, isn't it? 
Inquietant? Inquietant? Yes, it's very difficult for us because we supported both Vietnam and uh, Cambodia in their national liberation struggles. It's very unfortunate what's happening, and we just hope that it'll be settled peacefully. A few years ago, all the books published about China, from the right and from the left, were very favorable books. For instance, Machioki wrote a book about China, which is a, how do you say, a hymn to China, yeah. absolutely unconditional. Praise. Yes, absolutely unconditional. Even that one, he's a, he's a minister in the government now, mm -hmm. and uh, he wrote a book very favorable to China, too. And now you have there's a really a break mm -hmm. because all the books now published on, about, about this, by the same publisher actually mm -hmm. about China are against China more or less. That's published by uh, former uh, Red Guards in uh, mm -hmm. the, in in, uh, the, in China. The, the two death of Mao Zedong and mm -hmm. it's a very very tough one. <laughs> The Royal a couple, the um, the wife, she, she wrote a book, they were pro-Chinese, mm -hmm. unconditional Maoist and for many years. And she wrote a book, very favorable to China. Now they, they went to China for two years, they lived there, they worked there, and they wrote a book called Second Retour, Come Back from China. Second Return to China, yeah. Second Return from China. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. And uh, that's a very, very critical book about China mm -hmm. and Maoism. It's a bit embarrassing for me to take responsibility for my first book because I have to admit I was wrong. And it's not pleasant to have to say that. You wanted to show progress. Yes, I wanted to show the progress. But I think today that if one shows the progress in China, one is obliged to show the resistance. So what were you? Children of the bourgeoisie? You breaking with your environment? We were children of the bourgeoisie. We broke almost completely with our families. We abandoned our studies quite early and uh, went to work in factories. For how long? For us, about a year or two. We identified with workers quite fanatically and scorned intellectuals. One of our firm ideals during that period was to avoid becoming that kind of uh, armchair intellectual who flourishes in France, the kind that talks revolution but changes nothing in their lives. We really wanted to match principles and practice. On voulait réellement mettre en accord notre pratique et, et nos idées. Parce que vous avez cru à un moment que... But you believed once that China was all white. And maintenant... so now in your new book, you seem to be saying it's all black. Noir. And the two positions strike me as a bit exaggerated. Is it a bit like leaving the church? No, pas comme ça. No, it's not like that. Firstly, it's not completely black, the picture of China that we paint. And anyway, we just reported what we saw. We thought that it was a dictatorship on the enemy, but we quickly found out that the dictatorship was on the people too, like in uh, all socialist countries. What about private life? 
Tu veux te marier, you want to get married, you have to ask permission of the committee. If you want to have a child, ask the committee. You're given a number. La direction demande aux femmes, enfin aux personnes qui se sont mariées récemment, est-ce que vous voulez avoir un enfant? Quand est-ce que vous projetez de l'avoir? Les gens s'inscrivent. You can have a kid in 75, you can have one in 76, you in 77. If you don't get on with your husband, ask the committee for permission to divorce. À ta direction. Et ça, c est, c est dans, dans in every domain, parti, the party reigns supreme. Complètement, totalement souveraine. You can say that from the cradle to the grave, lit de mort, the Chinese are controlled in all that they do dans tout ce fait by the party. Il y a maintenant 25 expériences socialistes dans le monde. Je, je, j en, j en There are now some 25 socialist experiments in the world. Bon, il y a ces expériences, il y a des Each time that an experiment fails, we remake our investment somewhere else, redefining our concept of socialism. We used to say as communists that democracy here had no substance. But now I understand that there is no other democracy than the respect for forms. There is no other democracy than the respect for forms. Il n'y a pas d'autre démocratie que la codification, written codification of laws that people can refer to. Les gens peuvent se, peuvent se référer ou ils peuvent l'exiger l'application. Ça n'existe pas une autre démocratie. Demain, dans une France. Tomorrow in France, if the communists came to power, take just the problem of the press. Today, anybody can publish a newspaper. We ourselves, our little Maoist group, published a, a newspaper for years. On a pu, nous, comme petit groupe maoïste, even with very meager resources, with a circulation of some 5,000. And we had printers who were willing to print our paper because they were covered by the bank. But if the banks were nationalized, the printers would no longer do it. They'd have precise goals, democratically decided by the union, the government and the people, democracy in inverted commas. I remember when Solzhenitsyn's book came out in 1974, somebody asked Marché if Solzhenitsyn could have been published in a socialist France. He replied, certainly, if he could find a publisher. Let me give you another example. In China, during the Cultural Revolution, the Red Guards had their own uh, publications, and there were scores of underground newspapers. Now, when the leadership decided that the Red Guards were getting out of hand, making a nuisance of themselves, they didn't outlaw the Red Guards. They just cut off the supply of paper. But do you, do you think that our, maybe our opinions are so weak that we're convinced by everybody? I mean, Maybe everybody, yours. Everybody we talk to, I, everybody <laughs> I talk to, I, do you have an I, I find convincing. <laughs> yeah, no, well, I suppose. No, I agree. It's a, it's a, yeah, because they're very convincing in what they say. It's, Jesus, it's confusing. Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe at the end you'll just uh, yeah. abandon the whole thing and just uh, go to the countryside. <laughs> La vie s'écoule, la vie s'enfuit, les jours défilent. We are impressed by the Broyles, but Daniel Anselm is not impressed by us. This is depressing because Daniel Anselm is an experienced and knowledgeable man when it comes to our subject, the left. He used to be a communist and now is a writer activist for autogestion. He doesn't like our celebrities, our lack of contact with workers, and nor does he like being filmed. Disappointing as we may be, we still get a good meal, veal escalope. Daniel, what do you think of this film that uh, Michael is making? De la gauche, des hommes politiques, de tout ça. Sounds to me like a piece on high fashion. Well, for a foreign newspaper, one does an article on the fashion world of France. And you pick certain young designers who are up and coming and who would like to become more famous. Look, he's got a long cigar. 
very elegant. Yes, he's a Canadian, but he's acclimatized. Parisian. 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 A dandy of the boulevards. A century ago, he would have had a cane and yellow gloves. Sure, yellow gloves and a cane. C'est certain. Non, mais t'aurais eu des grands jours et une canne, c'est certain. And you would have had your table at the Café of Madrid. And now look at the terrible life you lead in this false capital. <laughs> Daniel knows perhaps more than anyone else about the 1968 uprising in Paris. But getting him to say something serious about it is another matter. Le fantôme de 60. Alors, tu prends une escalope. Okay, so you take a slice of veal, making sure it's not too thick. Make this dish then a slice of ham. So that's the recipe for Escalope 68? No. No connection? No? <laughs> I'm still trying to catch Bernard Henri Levy. He's the most outrageous and the most marketed of the new philosophers. He has a way with words that makes him a sort of philosophical pop star. The Mick Jagger of the brainy bunch. But we intend to stand our ground. Right, uh, you can ask the hard questions. Okay. And I'll be the nice guy. You'll be the you'll be you'll be the nice dummy boy, North American, asking okay. nice questions. And you can ask the tough ones, right? Uh, okay, I'll be the bad yeah. boy. La manière dont il faut traiter le marxisme, c'est au fond une manière matérialiste. It's almost in a Marxist way that one must deal with Marxism. Les marxistes nous ont toujours dit, peu importe après tout les textes de Tocqueville, peu importe la vérité des textes de Montesquieu, peu importe la vérité des textes de Benjamin Constant. La... Marxists have always said that it doesn't matter about the theory, judge the practice, judge materialistically. Thus they have rubbed our noses in the fact that the theory of liberty, equality and fraternity leads to the Vietnam War and to the massacres in Algeria. Eh bien, appliquons le même critère au Marxisme. So apply the same criteria to Marxism without worrying about the truth of Marxist writings. It's a philosophy which preaches against the state, but which has had the concrete effect of strengthening the state. So I simply ask that they apply to Marxism the same rigorous judgment that they demand we apply to liberal thought. Et je crois que c'est d'autant plus... And surely it's even more justified in the case of Marxism, which is a philosophy that claims to lead to a new, improved society, que de changer le monde, de transformer le monde, et d'y appliquer ma marque. Alors, appliquons ce critère. Would Marx approve of what's happening in the Soviet Union today? I have no idea. The question's meaningless. Just as meaningless as it would be to ask if De Tocqueville would be happy with what's happened in Vietnam. Anyway, Brezhnev is not mistaken when he thinks that he's inspired by Marx. And when you see, over the gates of Kolyma, the enormous Soviet concentration camp, a quotation from Marx, I say it's not misplaced. But all this evidence of oppression has existed for a long time. The trials of the 30s, the crushing of the Prague Spring. How come people like you have just uh, woken up? One reason, and I never tire of repeating it, is the appearance of that monumental work, the writings of Solzhenitsyn. In essence, he says the same things as Kravchenko and others, with the difference that Solzhenitsyn is an artist and not a reporter. Solzhenitsyn is an artist and not only a testimony. Dans le miracle de cette œuvre d'art qu'est l'archipel du Goulag. The Goulag archipelago is as important to our times as the Divine Comedy was important to Dante's era, 
as King Lear to the Shakespearean age, as important as Picasso's Guernica was for the Spanish Civil War, in brief, for me, he proves the thesis that only the artist and not the theoretician can stop the flow of blood. And the third reason that the message took so long to get through, the reason that uh, Western intelligentsia was deaf to Kravchenko, deaf to Kursler, was because the brains of the left were fuddled with Marxism. Dans les cervelles occidentales, dans les cervelles de gauche occidentale, dans la cervelle de Jean-Paul Sartre, par exemple, c'était la présence du marxisme ou d'un marxisme diffus. Donc, il est vrai que le troisième élément qui fait qu'on a enfin été sensible, on a enfin entendu ce message, cette vérité de l'horreur concentrationnelle, c'est la crise en Occident de la pensée marxiste. Le marxisme. Marxism made us deaf, Marxism made us blind. We had to purge ourselves of Marxism. So if the communists come to power, in France it will be very dangerous. More than dangerous, it will be catastrophic. The day the communists come to power, I swear to you, I will be the first French writer to change his nationality. You really think there's a danger of totalitarianism? I'm telling you, I would be the first French writer to shame the honor of his government by changing his nationality. Je pense donc effectivement que le Parti communiste au pouvoir. With the communists in power, with René Andrieux holding the reins of power, there would be a risk of totalitarianism. Rassurez-vous. Smiling, good fellow totalitarianism, but still totalitarianism. And there are signs today which don't lie. We were too impressed. Just taken by speed. No, I, uh, I wanted to. Uh, talk about my Cuban experiences because really it was quite good in Cuba. And I think pessimism is something very natural yeah. and that's a force because it's very at the, at the same time it's very easy to be pessimistic and it uh, seems uh, very natural. But you were dismissing him much more easily than that. I mean I think you were quite impressed by his arguments actually. Yeah, he has a per some personal force, yeah. you know. I yeah. agree with that. Bernard is really worried that we're giving in to an easy and comfortable cynicism. So he takes me to see another author, Amand Chélian, who has lived what he writes, and writes prolifically. No, no, what, 10, 12? I mean, that's, that's one on Algeria, another one on Algeria. That's about arms struggle in Africa. That's the same one in English. That's about the peasants of North Vietnam, Palestinian resistance, Palest again. That has been also in English. Mit révolutionnaire du tiers monde, you call that in English. Revolution in the third world. Myth, that's, though. Yes, but that's on myth. That's about Portuguese Guinea, that's about the Kurds. That's translation of a book in Arabic, in Turkish, in uh, Spanish, in Swedish. So you're an expert on the third world, but that doesn't mean that you've become through disillusionment a new philosopher, huh? Not at all. If that's what we're talking about, it's a very Parisian phenomenon, very French in fact, because in France we change fashions very fast. Fashions are discarded like uh, old clothes. We've had the structuralists, the Lacanians. We've been disciples of Sartre. And now they're putting the new philosophers on the market. Two years from now, nobody will read them or they'll be spitting on them. But actually, it's good that they are demystifying things for a generation which was really behind the times, for the generation of 68 who didn't know about the camps before reading Solzhenitsyn. So it's time that they discovered that the world isn't black and white. And that's a good thing. So I think that uh, it's not a, a philosophical question, it's a political one, really. I think that institutions uh, should be as strong and democratic as possible. 
uh, that pluralism is a lot better than one party. Uh, I don't believe that uh, in the third world people are uh, uh, generally uh, speaking uh, ready for uh, pluralism. After all, what is the tradition there? It's a despotic tradition of one monarch saying what has to be done. And uh, now we have one party which decides. Uh, they don't want dissent. And I would say either it's capitalist and they don't want dissent, or it's so-called socialism and they don't want dissent either. Whatever the country, I mean, you cannot ask to challenge power and you cannot say or uh, express your dissent. So the democratic ritual that Claudie Broyel now trusts, for want of something better, is underway. Il est 20 heures. Je déclare le scrutin clos pour la 21e section. So uh, we have the first estimation just after uh, 8 o'clock. 3.5% for the extreme left, uh, which is more than uh, expected. 21.5 for the Communist Party, which is a little bit more than expected. 25.5 for the Socialist Party and the radical, left radical, which is less than expected. I would say a victory of the left is very difficult now, yeah. even if they are in advance. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, Chirac much, uh, Chirac stronger yeah. than against uh, the people of Giscard. Dear comrades and friends, the results of the first round showed that there is a favorable climate for the victory of the left if they are united on the second round. Les maquisards sont dans les gares à Notre-Dame, mon Dieu, Paris, Vous avez euh, proposé une rencontre euh, à vos partenaires. Monsieur Femme a pratiquement répondu, Monsieur Long, euh, en laissant espérer que cette rencontre euh, aurait lieu demain. Un double express euh, bien serré une, euh, avec une goutte de lait et euh, une orange pressée. Merci beaucoup, monsieur. Ciao. I was due to leave, but now I just have to stay and see what happens. What are they saying? Hmm. From a newspaper to another, they say just the contrary. Gauche majoritaire. In the, in the rightist paper, they say it's equal. In the left paper, there's a majority of the left. Actually, it's about uh, break even, no? Until last night, it looked good for the left. Yesterday, Bernard met a taxi driver who'd been waiting 40 years. So who's going to win the elections? Oh, I hope it's the left. I've been waiting 40 years for that. It's worthwhile, but uh, couldn't it turn out badly? How can it go bad? There's no reason for it to go bad. You have the socialists as a rotation of power. It's not the communists alone who are going to take power with a knife between their teeth. What about the communists alone? Ah, that would scare me. That would scare any Frenchman who was not a diet in the war communist. I think that you're the first taxi driver I've met who's more for the left than for the right. It's not surprising. Taxi driving is a rather special business. We're always in contact with uh, well-to-do people. And sometimes we come to think that we're part of their world. But really, what are we? Not much. How much do you make a month? Oh, $700, working 60 hours a week. In the Socialist Party headquarters, we well-paid journalists from all over the world scrabble for a place from which to witness Mitterrand admit that he's been beaten. Obliquely, sadly, 
he will blame the communists both for the split and for tonight's defeat. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our country chose the union of the left at the last provincial and municipal elections. It is clear today that the hope that that victory aroused was betrayed by the rupture of the left on the 22nd of September 1977. History knows who bears the responsibility for that rupture. Those who never ceased in their attacks on us. Attacks as violent, as incessant as those of the right. The results are there. France stays with the same parliamentary majority and the same problems. Les 403 sont renversés, la grève sauvage générale. So you see that a uh, few hours after the election, the stock exchange is quite happy. Ses fêtards, ses flambeurs et ses communards Il est 5 heures 